My name's Rob Emanuel. I'm a VP of research at a company called Xavia. We're based out of Philly. Yeah, 65 developers, uh, or no, 65 people, uh, a bunch of developers. We have some data analytics people, um, uh, you know, project managers, uh, et cetera, all based around doing ge geospatial um, software. Uh, some products, some professional development. Um, included in one of our efforts is, is a project called GeoTrolls, um, which is an open source geospatial processing library, which I'll talk about later, uh, and which I'm the maintainer of. So what we'll cover today, um, go over like what, what does processing geospatial data at scale mean? To talk about like sort of the geospatial problem. Um, talk a little bit about what location tech is and then how uh, some of the projects in location tech use space filling curves to overcome some geospatial challenges. And then also give an overview of um, three location tech projects, including GeoTrellis, that uh, geospatially enable Apache projects. Um, yeah. So processing geospatial data at scale. Like I like to kind of take this phrase and then chop it up and kind of you know dive into it because it's a little bit buzzwordy. So what what is this? So geospatial data. Let's talk about that first. Geospatial data consists uh, mainly. It, I mean, it's it's data that has a location, right? So if you have any sort of data, it has a location. That's geospatial data. We mainly uh, chop it up into two different categories: raster data or vector data, right? So looking at raster data first. What is raster data? It's a, you know, a matrix of cells. They can be any values. Right here, this is like just yellow and blue. Uh, and so the geospatial aspect of it is when we take this and we put it over a location. And now we can use, start to use those values to say, OK, well, Philadelphia is on its east coast blue, and then kind of in the, it's mostly yellow everywhere else. Another example of raster data is satellite imagery. Uh, where satellite imagery can have like three bands uh, and that can combine into like an RGB image here. Uh, this is a Landsat image that actually has 11 different sensors that has 11 different bands for each scene. Um, so there's multi-band uh, raster data such as satellite imagery. And then something that's like worldwide but of course a resolution is you can describe like temperature data, right? So you're kind of describing a sort of continuous value over a surface to some estimation by like just binning it into some resolution. For vector data, uh, vector data is like point line polygon geometry stuff. Um, so if I do a Google search and say, hey, where are bars around here? Um, I'm going to get a bunch of point data. So it's not just the, the location, like we have sort of a lat long or XY location, but it's also the metadata that's uh, associated with those points. Uh, it can also be lines, right? So here we have a road network in North America. Uh, some are red, some are blue. I'm not sure what that means, but that's the metadata associated with those geometries. And then polygons, right? So just describing regions in Germany. And then so you can combine all types of vector data into these interesting uh, data sets that uh, can represent can really map out the world in, in a pretty detailed way. So this is an this is a rendering of OpenStreetMap. Uh, OpenStreetMap.org, you can go there. You can like look up your address, find your road, and then make edits to it uh, if you find something off. Like it's a Wikipedia of maps. And it's in a lot of places in the world, it's the most detailed map, better than Google Maps. Um, it's a really interesting project, so I, I'd say check it out. All right, so that's a little bit about geospatial data, right? So what is processing geospatial data, data mean? Is it, it's just, if we just think it's like, oh, lat long coordinates, we're just processing doubles, that's not you know, unique. Uh, but actually, there's a lot of unique challenges with processing geospatial data. For instance, this is a really easy problem to solve just with your brain, right? You're like, OK, the triangle contains the point. Uh, the hexagon doesn't contain the point. But if we take a minute and just try to think of a generic algorithm that does this for any polygon, and point, it's actually really non-trivial, right? There's like, if you know computational geometry, you're just like, oh, you just do yada yada yada. But it's 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 uh yeah, it's, it, you have to kind of work in a space that's kind of unique to the two-dimensional plane. And then if you do things like include multi-polygons and multi-points, and say, so, okay, give me all all of these points that are contained by the multi-polygon that is India, uh, you can see that it, it quickly gets pretty complicated. Uh, raster operations are sort of uh, a little bit simpler, which is great. Um, 
but they have a lot more, a uh, lot more data. Uh, what is the what is the term that uses? Raster is faster, but vector is more corrector. I think um, it's faster because it's just like a straight up operation. Okay, t t take the one cell, take the other cell, combine them. I'm done. Uh, so here's a local operation, which called a local operation in map algebra, saying just take each cell, you know, and add them together. And here I'm saying blue and yellow equals green. Right. So I can produce other do transformations and combine raster data into other raster data. And what you can do with that where it's useful is doing things like suitability maps. Um, so if I have a bunch of different layers and then I weight them according to some model, uh, I can sort of dynamically see on a map, okay, I'm going to paint uh, regions that are highly suitable based on my model, uh, a certain color, and then, and then you know, uh, regions that are not suitable for whatever my model is modeling um, another color. And another type of uh, uh, raster operation is a focal operation. This kind of, if we're working with imagery, it's like, you know, convolution with a kernel. Uh, but we, in geospatial call things like focal operations, we're taking some, like for this, for instance, this is taking a sum over a three by three neighborhood of the pixel. And what you can do with that is things like hill shade. Uh, so if I have an elevation raster uh, that just says for this cell, it's at a specific resolution. Uh, I think this is 30 meter by 30 meter. Uh, for this cell, this is where the cell is um, in elevation. And then, so if I take the, if I measure the slope with a focal operation and the aspect, and then I say, okay, the sun is like over here, I can actually render uh, a shading of the terrain that allows you to visualize it. And we'll see a little bit more of hill shade later. Uh, then you can do things with like point to ras or like vector to raster operations, uh, taking a kernel density uh, to sort of blur the values of point data into a raster. So you can create things like heat maps. I think. We all kind of like seen this before and kind of intuitively know what this, what this means. Um, and then uh, like polygonal summary of suitability maps, right? So we have a suitability map. It's a bunch of layers uh, multiplied by weights combined. And then we take a polygonal area and then we do some summary score over it, right? So kind of building up these uh, basic operations into uh, more complex like geospatial operations. And then one really cool one that we're working on is Xavier is um, doing feature extraction or image segmentation. Uh, so taking like imagery and then running TensorFlow models to train on uh, you know, classifying the data into various, uh, each pixel into a, a various classes. And then what we can do is just extract uh, vector data out of the regions and say, okay, here are building footprints or here's where tree canopy exists. So that's processing geospatial data at scale. Uh, so what's, what's, or sorry, processing geospatial data. So geospatial data at scale, what's the story there? Uh, you know, what scale are we talking about? So vector data gets pretty big. So that OpenStreetMap XML for the whole entire world is like 750 gigs. Mapbox did a blog post a while ago about three years of geotag tweets. That was th th three terabyte. Um, raster data gets really big, especially when you talk about satellite imagery. Uh, so Landsat 8 is a, well, the Landsat program is a, program run by NASA and the USGS. Uh, it's been running since the 70s. Um, the latest iteration is Landsat 8, and it takes um, 30 meter by 30 meter resolution images of the world all the time. It's just collecting data up there, and uh, that data is um, you know, free for the public to use. Uh, and so, it, like I said, it collected 11 bands. Um, each, each, uh, each scene is about two gigs, let's say. Sort of back of the back of the envelope calculations. So I want to specifically talk about Landsat on uh, AWS. So there's an S3 bucket that has Landsat 8 uh, from 2015 and beyond, uh, and then selects older scenes. Um, and I counted a couple days ago, and it has over a million scenes. Uh, so that's a lot of data. But how much how much data is that? That's about two petabytes of imagery data just sitting on AWS, available to the public for free, which is Awesome on, on AWS's part. Um, so to try to visualize that much data, I like to use an analogy, right? So cell phones, um, not everybody has them, but they're very common. Uh, this particular one, besides catching fire, it's not nice to just kick Samsung anymore. It's like, they've had it so rough. Uh, but th this one is that uh, cell phone. Uh, it holds about 64 gigabytes. Uh, and if we dedicate it solely to holding Landsat 18s, it would hold roughly 32 Landsat 18s, right? Um, 
And so I used to say this is how many people it would take to hold this. This is actually no longer true because the, the, the amount of imagery available is just grown and grown. So when it was about a petabyte, I was like, this many people, which holds 20,000, about 20,000 people. This is a Wells Fargo Center uh, where the Philadelphia Flyers play, right? So a, a stadium packed full of people with cell phones that have uh, roughly 32 Landsat uh, 8 um, scenes on their phone, right? Uh, so that's the analogy. They're going to come back, so keep those Flyers fans in mind. All right, so that's about the scale that we're, we're kind of talking about. So processing data at scale is, um, you know, a, a whole topic that's been, that's been researched and a lot of code out there. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, like, the generic problem of, of uh, processing data at scale and then, like, how we piggyback on that to make it geospatial specific. Right, so the Apache Software Foundation has plenty of, uh, really awesome projects about doing stuff at scale. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about two of them today, Spark and Accumulo. Let's start with Spark. Uh, so Apache Spark is a distributed computation engine. Um, it's an API that lets you work with distributed data as if, sort of as if it were a collection, uh, which I think is one of the really core value things of Spark. You kind of treat it as a collection. You can do functional transformations to that collection and that builds up a directed acyclic graph of operations, and then you sort of send that to the, uh, or, or you execute that as, uh, with the distributed computation engine, and it takes care of distributing all the work out to your cluster and doing all of that, um, all of that uh, heavy lifting of, of uh, distributed computation. Uh, it's written in Scala, uh, but it has language bindings in a number of different um, other languages. So, the where where I like to you know use this analogy again is like Spark would be if you if you wanted to count all of the images that everybody had on their phones right say it wasn't exactly 32 each uh, you might like go to the center of the ice and say hey Flyers fans how many images do you have on your phones and some people might shout back numbers at you you're just like what are you talking about and some people might be like bring out the t-shirt gun um, but so Spark is sort of the the uh, person at the um, at the stadium that works for the stadium and says like, okay, why don't you tell me what your problem is, how you how you like what you want done, and then I have a number of like sub workers that are in each section, and I'll tell them what to do. They'll speak to their section. They'll say, hey, can you just tell me how many you know images you have, and then I'll tally the count, and then I'll give it back to you. Okay, thanks for making my life easy, right? Uh, so that's that's sort of what Spark does in this in this analogy. All right, so Cumulo is another Apache project. Um, it's a big table clone, uh, so it's a Columnar database, NoSQL database. Uh, its records are stored in HDFS, which is the Hadoop distributed file system um, where data is sharded across a cluster, um, and it stores it in a lexicographically sorted table index. So sort of like this one-dimensional index. Uh, sorted index of values, uh, so it uh, can look look up values very quickly. You can imagine it as like a key value store, where the key is roughly a, a row in a column, and then the values in here is integers. And then if we wanted to, uh, we would have this table sorted and split up uh, along tablet servers. Um, and then so the master kind of knows where all the data lives. So when you make a request to it, you say. Give me like row C through row F. It knows how to uh, where to where to ask and uh, grab that data from. So if I were to say, okay, uh, I want Landsat images from 2014. Uh, if if I just if I just ask that of Spark, Spark would be like, all right, that's cool. But I'm gonna have to ask every single person, do you have any 2014 images? Uh, and it's gonna take a little bit, but I'll get back to you. It'll be fine. It's like, okay, well, if everything's stored in a cumulo, cumulo is sort of the uh, concierge with the, table, with the seating chart as the Flyers fans come in and say, okay, let me see your phone. Okay, you have like these, this set of data. Why don't you sit here in this section, in this section. Now a Spark can talk to me, say, hey, where are the people that have 2014? It's like, I've already sorted people by that. Here, just ask these three sections and you can get the answer really quick, right? Love the analogy, all right. Uh, so let's make that question geospatial, right? So let's instead of say by year, we say for some country, 
like, or North America, right? So now I have this like complex polygon that I want to say, give me all scenes that intersect with that complex polygon. Well, it's back to square one. It's like, okay, ask every single person to do this intersection operation on their scenes and, and give you back data. Um, so that's not ideal. And that's where Location Deck comes in, projects at Location Deck. Right, so first I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what Location Tech is. Um, it's a working group inside of the Eclipse Foundation uh, for geospatial software, right? So Eclipse has a number of working groups, some dedicated science and other things, and we're the geospatial one. Um, to me, as a developer and, a, and maintainer of uh, one of these projects, it's sort of a, a list, it's a list of projects, right? It's a group of projects that are doing similar work to me. Uh, in the open source world that I can um, you know, participate in their development, we can bounce ideas off of each other, it sort of provides us a community uh, with which to sort of, yeah, try to, try to advance the uh, open source geospatial in general um, together. And then so there's a lot of different types of projects here, they're all geospatial, but the ones, uh, there's three in particular that I want to talk about today uh, that deal with uh, geospatial or big, big geospatial data, and that's GeoTrellis, GeoWave, and GeoMesa, all very cleverly named Trellis, Wave, Mesa. Uh, so one thing that sort of binds these three projects together is that we all use space filling curves to, um, to deal with this specific problem of, okay, how does that seeding chart get arranged so that I can ask geospatial questions and it accumulate knows what the hell I'm talking about, right? What are space filling curves? They are curves like this. Uh, sort of these recursively defined curves that fill up the entire space. Uh, they um, exist at different resolutions. So this is a Hilbert curve, right? And we can recursively construct this curve. Uh, and so as you take, so mathematically, like space filling curves is actually a mathematical formulation. And if you take the limit uh, of this recursive process to infinity, uh, this curve will actually, it's a continuous curve that hits every real value point in that, that n-dimensional space, right? But for us, we don't want all of the points. We just want to sort of cut up our image into um, you know, some like grid of points that's of a fine enough resolution that it works for us, and then run a, a, you know, a Hilbert curve or a Z order curve uh, through it. And what this allows us to, oh, so, uh, yeah, this is an example of like if I cut my, you know, world map into tiles, um, you know, you can see that you could refer to, say, Brazil as, you know, uh, column five, row six. But also if I number each one of these uh, sort of points in the line, I could refer to it by some other index that's actually just one number. Right? Um, so it doesn't have to just be two-dimensional. Um, space filling curves can go to n dimensions. Um, this is an example of a three-dimensional space filling curve. Uh, so yes, yeah, sort of in a formulation here, right? We have some space. Uh, this is a three-dimensional space. Can be two-dimensional. Can be n-dimensional. If we partition that space into, um, uh, you know, uh, equal area uh, partitions. Uh, we can take the center of those partitions and sort of call that the grid point, and then we draw a curve through each of those points, and now we have a one-dimensional indexing of each of those areas uh, that refer back to you know, the spaces in S. Right. So what does this allow us to do? It allows us to do this sort of range decomposition. So here's, you know, it, to kind of tie it back to the example, like if here's the space of the world, right? And let's just say, I said North America, but let's make it easy and just do a bounding box. And I say, okay, I want all images that intersect with this bounding box. I can actually decompose that into a series of one dimensional ranges where I'm actually asking, okay, I want index 70 through 75, 92 through 90, 99, et cetera. Um, and now Accumulo can understand that. I can actually pose uh, the question of multiple ranges to accumulate, and it can just chunk through them and give me back all of my ranges, right? Um, yeah, and that's and it doesn't just work with accumulo. Uh, you know, any any sort of geospatial or spatiotemporal, right? If I said, give me North America, 
in 2014, if I have my space indexed uh, by a three-dimensional space filling curve, I can just decompose those ranges and now pose that question to a number of different uh, backends that uh, deal, deal much better with the one-dimensional index range than uh, some sort of like two-dimensional thing. And it also allows me to totally genericize the way that I query backends so that we can uh, support many backends with this, with this method. Uh, any questions on space filling curves? I don't want to think we're, this is, this is fine to have interaction if, uh, if, if, if anybody has questions, just, just pop them up. Yeah? And so, yeah, so the question is like, so if we have some set and we want to add to it, um, yeah, we would, find, we would find what location it was and then, you know, so save that with that index. Um, and so a really important part of space filling curves indexing versus like something like R trees or there's, there's other spatial indexes that get built up. Those are... Uh, I don't know the actual dichotomy of what to call them, but like they're like static indexes, or they're like you have to save an index, right? So it's like I have a set of index data, and I've built up this index, and then so when I save a new piece of data, I have to modify the index to account for that. Yeah. Space filling curves are a mathematical construct, so they have some configuration, right? And I say, okay, my configuration is that it's this resolution and it's a Hilbert curve, and now I can mathematically compute any point on this index. So I don't need to like store an index. It just kind of exists. And then I say, okay, what is, what is you know, the coverage here? And that's range decomposition is, is also true for that. It's just like, okay, I have this bounding box. Just from the configuration of the Hilbert curve, tell me what my ranges are, and it'll, it'll give it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the three projects in a little more uh, detail. Uh, so GeoMesa is um, a project that it's, it's sort of an umbrella for a lot of really cool geospatial technology. Um, but if I wanted to boil it down to the core functionality, I would say it's geospatially enabling a Cumulo and accessing it through GeoServer. Uh, GeoServer is an open source um, uh, Java server for uh, serving um, you know, geospatial information on, on the web, right? Um, it's, it implements a bunch of what's called OGC standards for, for, for interacting with geospatial data. Um, it's part of um, OSGEO. Uh, it's a well-known, well well-established um, server for this sort of stuff. Uh, right, and so it implements this, the space field and curve stuff to actually um, uh, be able to save off vector data and query it very fast. So trillions of points, et cetera. Uh, any scale of vector data. A little video of like a UI being served by GeoMesa, right? We can filter points on polygon and then also by attribute. Uh, they also have Python bindings, so you can interact with uh, your geospatial data in a Jupyter notebook, uh, do things like uh, uh, kernel density, sort of heat map generation off your vector data, and then also dealing with Basically, it's temporal vector data, like here's point data for like taxi locations that we can visualize um, over time. And here's another heat map example. Uh, another cool feature of GeoMesa is that it works with Spark SQL. Spark SQL is um, Spark's engine for allowing you to pose SQL queries to your distributed data sets. Um, it's a really great project and um, yeah, if, if, if you're dealing with large data in general and want to pose a SQL query to it, check out Spark SQL. It's, it's a really advanced, like, awesome project. Uh, and for, for a SQL query like, okay, select a tweet where the tweet user ID equals the user user ID, Spark SQL can already handle that. But where the GeoMesa comes in is this bounding box, right? So now we're, now we're dealing with geospatial location. We're saying, okay, give me this thing, but inside of some geospatial area. Without GeoMesa, Spark SQL can't handle that. Cumulo can't handle that. So this is what it's enabling, right? 
Uh, G-Wave is the uh, second project I'll talk about. Um, so this is a pretty cool graphic generated by GeoWave. Uh, it's based off of GPS track data. So this is actual point data that if you do, uh, if you have enough of it and you do uh, sort of a heat map on it, you can actually extract the road networks um, from the data, from just point data, right? So this is points over time, it's collapsed into, you know, where are people most of the time? Uh, and you start to see this emerging of, you know, where people actually go, uh, which is great. And then so GeoWave, uh, again, like sort of in a nutshell as a core functionality, uh, can be expressed as geospatially enabling Cumulo and accessing it through GeoServer. Sounds very similar to what I just said, right? Uh, which is true. Their, their core purpose overlaps pretty significantly. Um, there are differences, though. Um, they, were sort of, they were sort of developed concurrently, uh, one uh, by a company called CCRI and one uh, by uh, Radiant Blue um, and uh, Booz uh, Allen Hamilton uh, in conjunction with the, the NGA. Um, one is in Scala, one's in Java, right? Uh, but they also use uh, two different space filling curve index types. Uh, and G-Wave is built as an n-dimensional um, indexing mechanism. So where GeoMesa only handles 2D and 3D data, which takes care of a lot of your use cases, especially geospatial, um, uh, G-Wave is built more as like a generic n-dimensional indexing engine for Accumulo. And also there is uh, you know, partial support for Cassandra, HBase, and uh, a couple other backends for GeoMesa. And then uh, Accumulo has put a lot, uh, I'm sorry, G-Wave has put a lot of uh, effort into its HBase support. All right, GeoTrellis. Now I get to talk about my favorite one because that's the one that I, uh, that I you know, maintain and, and uh, lead up development for, and you can tell by the, how much I talk about it. OK, um, so GeoTrellis is a Scala library for doing uh, geospatial operations and working with geospatial data types. So if you're doing anything Scala um, uh, and geospatial, it probably has some functionality that you'd be interested in. Uh, and then with that functionality, it enables Spark to work with geospatial data. So working with Apache Spark over various backends uh, to do uh, geospatial processing uh, with a focus on raster data. So raster, uh, we sort of come from the raster world. Um, we do have uh, capabilities and data types for vector, uh, especially in the core stuff, uh, and also in Spark, um, and a couple other geospatial data types but we mainly focus on, on raster. Uh, this is a big ugly slide about like all the things you kind of can you know, sum up about GeoTrellis, right? So we have geospatial plus Scala, uh, and then so raster is point cloud, vector, and vector tiles, which are a couple different um, geospatial data types, plus Spark over, we work with Cassandra, HBase, uh, S3, Hadoop, Accumulo, and then also uh, support vector work with uh, GeoMesa and GeoWave. Uh, to boil it down a little bit more to sort of like a higher level, uh, we like to think about it as like a library that can contribute to any sort of Scala geospatial application, uh, working with raster data in Scala, and then also uh, doing large scale raster processing uh, in Apache Spark. And this, uh, that dichotomy kind of uh, is a useful breakdown for sort of a design principle that we that we adhere to or have kind of come to and kind of crystallized that I think might be useful uh, in a more general case as well. Um, so our systems tend to have two different processes. Like when you're working with big data, you have a bunch of data that you want to do processes to, and then you have like these user applications that you want to actually use that data, right? Because having the data is not enough. We need to build applications that allow users to interact with it. Uh, so what we find is we, we end up writing a batch preprocessing pipeline, which sort of puts all of that, you know, sort of the raw data and does ETL or uh, transformations on it into some in, uh, intermediate format. And then we build up web servers that can read that format and then do uh, on the fly transformations of it, right? So if we think about it as a processing pipeline, right, where we're going from raw data to serve data, uh, we have raw data, which could be like the Landsat images or elevation data or some sort of like. GeoTIFF that lives on some uh, you know, FTP server somewhere. Uh, and we somehow have to turn that into 
information, say like that statistical, you know, zonal summary of, of, of something. Um, that's the pipeline, and we can, we can choose to build our application uh, to serve off of that, you know, sort of on that spectrum of the pipeline, where we, if we say, okay, we wanna do it completely dynamic, uh, the application can live just in total raw data, and that's really good for flexibility. I can write any sort of transformation on that data, but then if I do it at request time, it's gonna be slow, like I'll have to like, Resample the data, modify it into like the web map tile thing, paint it as a PNG, and send it off. Um, and even like figure out how to how to get at that raw data. Uh, so on the other end is if I do it completely static, I can just do all my pre-processing. Now it's exactly what the application needs, which is great. You can do that. You can fast. You can serve it very quickly. Um, but there's a lot less flexibility. So for instance, if I was serving uh, Landsat tile on a web map and I just made a bunch of PNGs, I can just like ship PNGs and just be like, yeah, that's, there's no processing there. But then if I said, okay, I wanna color correct that image a little bit, I can't do that because the PNGs are already there, right? I mean, I guess you could do it off of a PNG. That's, that might be a bad example. <laughs> but if I wanted to do like a suitability map, like I no longer can do that, I'd have to extract the values out of PNG. It's just like further, that, that painting of the PNG is sort of at the end of our, our processing chain. Um, so yeah, less, less flexibility. Uh, so what we find is that we have this mix of static and dynamic. We have this you know, batch pre-processing step where we take the data, we do like an ingest of it, and then we write up uh, web servers that use sort of that uh, you know, Scala GeoTrellis stuff to read it in, do, perform some computations, and then serve it out. Right? And then so usually in our Scala applications, we have actually two sub-projects named ingest or ETL and then server, uh, which represent the two sides of this um, this spectrum. And then, yeah, you can kind of think of the two sides of GeoTrellis being like, for the dynamic per request processing, we're using sort of GeoTrellis with Scala, uh, and then for the static, we're, we're using it with Spark. Uh, so an example of rendering um, elevation and land classification with GeoTrellis and Spark, sort of this completely uh, you know, di uh, static batch processing example. Um, this is, so land classification is like per pixel, is this road, is this water, is this you know, tree canopy, right? Uh, and then elevation is, like I said, just the, the elevation of the terrain. Um, so these numbers are old, uh, so take them with a grain of salt, but it's sort of a measuring stick, right? Um, basically, running, running 100 spot instances, we have 400 CPUs, a terabyte and a half of memory. Uh, with spot instances, it's kind of nice because it costs less than, a, less than $5 an hour. Um, uh, so running this process to generate uh, just this, this nationwide map of, the, of this, the combination of these two uh, raster, raster data, the, this is a Spark UI as the job runs. Um, so the point of showing this is the top part is a representation that Spark gives you of the directed acyclic graph of operations um, as they're sort of executing. And you can kind of see how complex it is, right? There's a lot going on here. With the programming API, I don't have to write this, I just say, you know, take this, reproject it to this, you know, projection, tile it to this layout, yada, yada, yada. It's, it's really kind of hit, this complexity is really hidden via the GeoTrellis and the Spark API. And then down here, um, this is showing that there's a shuffle read here that's like over a bit, a little bit over a terabyte. Um, so that's like the data size that that got to while it was doing the processing job. Um, and it pyramids it out and saves it all to S3 and it took about uh, at, you know, at one and a third hour. Um, and what we get is this uh, kind of nice map of the combination of these two data sets, right? So this is the elevation that is, uses that hill shade that we talked about earlier, but also colors it via color ramp. So we can see that the mountain, I mean the color is kind of bad here, but we can see that the mountain peaks are sort of a darker color and then down in the valleys is a lighter color. As, as well as the uh, NLCD data that's pointing out what, uh, the roads and the, and the water, right? So we get to like make this combination. Uh, and if we zoom out a little bit, we see this, this is the Blue Ridge Mountains, and you can imagine the level of detail that we just saw, and that being all over the place, and then um, you know, at, a, at a national level. Uh, so there's a lot of data to chunk through, and uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of one of these sort of static batch processing 
um, jobs that you can write with GeoCharles. To ignore these missing tiles. That was in the source data. That's not our fault. Uh, so examples of the dynamic per request processing stuff. Uh, this is some of Xavier applications that use uh, GeoCharles servers. Um, so for example, we have like a flood modeling thing that takes terrain data. Um, you know, you set a water depth and it kind of shows you where the extent of flooding will be uh, and gives you some statistics. Here, these are all dynamically calculated based off of not, not the raw, raw uh, elevation data, but the ingested elevation data that's indexed via space filling curve so that we can grab the raw values, but they're already sort of like in these nice tile format that you can query very quickly. And then here's an example of like uh, taking that NLCD data and then computing some um, statistics about like, you know, how much is this polygon uh, open water versus how much is uh, cultivated crops, right? So this is the type of information that we try to extract from raster data, um, and we can do that with, with GeoTrails. And then, so this is a, uh, was a demo example of taking um, climate forecasting data. Uh, there's, there's these climate forecasting models. This one is CCSM4. Uh, and they predict um, temperature max, temperature min, and precipitation over a 100-year uh, period. Um, so this is saying in 2056, for different RCP scenarios, which are, uh, stand for like different carbon emission scenarios, like RCP 85 is that we continue to emit carbon um, you know, at the rate that we are. RCP 45 is that we actually curb carbon. Uh, and then so there was just an uh, interactive thing that showed the, the state with the max average difference between those two scenarios. And you can see that it was Iowa with almost 20 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, zoom back out. So we just covered these three geospatial projects. Um, and at their core, they use some of the uh, same open source geospatial technology. Uh, so core libraries for vector data, right? JTS is actually a location, another location tech project that's, if you're doing any sort of computational geometry stuff with um, Java, uh, definitely check that out as far as like that intersects, uh, do, you know, do, do these polygons intersect to do cropping and stuff like that. It's, it's a great library. It's used by GeoTools, which is the main library behind these two. And then we use it directly and wrap it into a Scala-friendly API. Um, and then for raster data, again, um, GMS and GeoWave used the Java-based GeoTools, and we wrote our own core raster types to be very, very fast. Some current work that we're doing, um, there's a collaboration between GeoTools and GeoMesa on exposing Python bindings and being able to work with this stuff through Jupyter Notebook. A lot of data, data science want to just like play around with geospatial data uh, that comes from a large data set, but let me you know, play with it in Python, use my NumPy, you know, uh, SciPy stuff uh, in Jupyter. So we're, we're working on allowing that. That should come out in the summer. Um, and then uh, GeoDocker is an effort to uh, dockerize a lot of the uh, components that we use, including all of these projects. and then the uh, constituent project, project. So if you're working on dockerizing any of uh, the sort of Apache technology, we have some work there that might be uh, generally useful even outside of the geospatial realm. And then so if you're interested in any of this stuff, please, uh, please get involved. We have a mailing list, um, propose some, some projects. And with that, let's go to lunch. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So I don't know if I missed, uh, you were in a kind of area that I'm not that interested in. I have a, do have a lot of interest in geospatial data for networking analysis and plotting IoT data on these uh, on <coughs> maps or um, calculating mesh networks and all these um, algorithms for, so you mentioned about the Ethereum kind of polygon and all that. So would I be able to use Which, what is the functionality? Path profile analysis. No, sorry. Uh, elevation profile. Oh, yes, yes. Um, we don't have a specific function for that, but that's, uh, that we have the building blocks where you have a raster, you, you put a line over it, and then you rest, you, what you do is you take 
the points of the lines, or you you make uh, very you know depending on the resolution that you want, you make additional points on the line, and then you it's a vector to raster operation where you just line it up and say, okay, what is the elevation per point in the line, and then now you just have that data and you can visualize it. They I'm sure they had that like packaged up nicely. It's, Nice. Yeah. Yeah. We we're at the library level, so it's like you could build something like that with GeoTrellis. What's that? Um, I don't think anybody's done elevation profile, but honestly, I don't know all. There's like companies that use GeoTrellis that are doing stuff that they don't <laughs> tell us about. Uh, so potentially, it's something we've talked about too, because um, there's there's uh, there's a number of like ways to do that, like MapsN. Has a has a pretty great um, elevation profile tool that's sort of like fun to look at. Um, if it's something that you wanted to do like at scale, I think that's where you'd w probably want GeoTrails to come in and be able to just you know do it either a lot of lines all at once in a in a batch job. Um, but yeah, it's it's like a, it's an algorithm that I I can like kind of write in my head. But it it, it would be like you'd have to go on the Gitter channel and be like, how do I do this and Mm -hmm. So we do have a lot of stuff related to this. Uh, there are some tools that I'm trying to find tools that, that are already available. Mm -hmm. I can write some software. So I wrote software that does rely on some third parties to do fast batch profile analysis without right. doing it myself. And uh, but I want to I need to make a show, I need to wait for the user to navigate and all that, but more in a product side yeah, like another sort gotcha. of hardware. I want to get burden out of it. Yeah. So uh, As far as a productized version, expecting people have to be done something like this because I know there are products um, that GIS systems and all that that are built on top of open source mm -hmm. tools. So maybe um, your talk is in the right place. Uh, no, I think there's there's uh, a lot of room to grow as far as like productized versions of geospatial operations like this. Um, like Xavier has a uh, product that we're developing called Raster Foundry. Uh, which is kind of like that. It's, it's more focused on the, uh, the imagery side of things, aerial imagery and satellite imagery, and then taking a lot of the functionality that GeoTrails provides and kind of productizing it, like being a, you know, allowing users to interact with it without having to code. Um, there's, uh, it's on the roadmap to develop that for more than imagery. So one of the things that you know, is on the list somewhere that's probably a little further down uh, is doing view shed operations on elevation data, right? So if you're talking about like where, you know, I have a cell tower here, where can, who can see it, right? Uh, yeah, that, that yep. So it's that. totally. So so line of sight, like we have view shed in GeoTrellis, so people that are developing applications can utilize that. But there's there's not really like a push button way, and we're actually currently develop, developing a demo. Uh, application that we'll probably like have up somewhere that's you know kind of like has a region of elevation and you you know drop a point and it shows you the the line of sight right so a lot of that time like visualizing what uh, uh, it should be I mean it's gonna be up on github uh, but if you uh, give me your card or something I'll I'll just notify you when that's done uh, yeah, and then so a lot of a lot of time it's just like visualizing it is great, uh, and then but you, yeah, yeah. So actually extracting the polygon and being like this is the actual view shed, is more complicated. So it's like that's that's the sort of stuff that you can build those pipelines with GeoTrellis. And if there's like, yeah, that's I mean, it's one of the things that Azavia kind of does as a professional services company for that side of it um, is. You know, when people come to us with problems and say, we need to do X, Y, Z, we have GeoTrails to lean on to build those types of applications. And then because it's open source, a lot of other companies also have that tooling to, build, to lean on. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Any other questions?
Cool. Well, thanks. Oh, you got one. Yes. Uh, we, we have tried. Uh, there was like a research project that we did maybe a couple years ago. Um, what we found at the time is that the overhead for pushing data, like large raster data, in and out of GPUs uh, was not really worth it because we can go as fast as we need to uh, on the CPU. That being said, uh, you know, GPUs have kind of advanced since then. Um, we do use GPUs for like you know, in using like TensorFlow or like other machine learning uh, uh, algorithms. And we kind of just push the data over there, let them deal with the GPUs, and then come back. If there was, um, if there was some, like, I, I, it's still an open question. Like, are there, are there libraries that will allow us to like really effectively uh, lean on the GPU to translate our raster data into a format that can be shipped to the GPU, do some processing, um, and, then, and then ship back? Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks so much. Cheers.